Thanks a lot. It was a very interesting uh, talks. But I have such a question, which is a bit off topic. In the talks, it was mentioned that uh, there was quite dubious data on increased uh, incidence risk if uh, when oral contraceptives are given. Uh, but then, with uh, for the follow up of the patients, uh, the oral contraception is given uh, absolutely with no problem. So what the speakers can say about that, is there any uh, truly concerns uh, regarding the risk when we use, uh, when we uh, when we give uh, uh, contra oral contraceptions? And second question, it's most, uh, uh, today we talk about not to use uh, instrumental abortion, like vacuum aspiration, acute retention, they prefer to use uh, uh, pharmacological abortions. What is the value of pharmacological Ecological uh, abortion and for the uh, repeated curettage, can we use this method when we are afraid of perforation? Can we use pharmacological uh, abortion uh, from that point of view, so to say? So, to answer your first question about the use of oral contraceptive pills, um, when this was first looked at uh, in the 1970s. Uh, the dose of hormones in the oral contraceptives was much higher than we see used in contraception used today. And the early analysis suggested that uh, when you had such high dose hormones, that there may be an increased risk of uh, causing persistent disease following a molar evacuation. More modern analyses from a number of different centers uh, around the world, including our own, have repeatedly shown that for modern low-dose hormone contraceptives, this is not an issue. So you can use hormone contraception straight after a molar evacuation. If that's your question, it, it's safe to do it. There's no increased risk of persisting disease that any of us have been able to show. Um, in terms of pharmacological abortion, um, I, I, yeah, this happens all over the world, and the question really is, is how many of those patients might have trophoblastic disease that we simply don't know about? And the same is also true if a woman miscarries in the toilet at home, you've got no idea whether that was a normal pregnancy or a molar pregnancy. Um, I don't think we have a complete solution to this, but uh, we published a paper some years ago showing that people who go to abortion centers and have uh, either medical abortion or a, um, um, a more mechanized mechanical abortion um, are at increased risk of having molar disease that's missed. Um, it's hard to quantify this because we only pick up the missed cases and they usually present with perforation of the uterus or bleeding complications. Uh, and the way I think that you can mitigate this is anybody that has a, a, um, 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 an abortion of some description should perhaps check their HCG at home three or four weeks later to know that the HCG is normal. If their positive pregnancy test is still positive, then they might be encouraged to go back to seek advice and certainly shouldn't start trying to have another baby until their pregnancy test is negative. I think that would be a simple solution. Um, I'm not sure whether that answers your question. It does, okay. You had a third question. Can someone remind me what that third question was? Was that about when to do DNCs? Uh, you talk, we talked about the repeated uh, curettage uh, when treating such patients. So can we use pharmacological abortion uh, as an alternative to mechanical curettage? I think if you've got a first DNC, um, a suction curatage with a histopathological diagnosis of a mole afterwards, I would never then go and try and use a medical induced abortion after that because you're going to cause repeated contractions of the uterus with that and that might actually disseminate the disease. There is a risk of trophoblast embolism to the lungs. I would certainly never encourage someone to do that. Does that answer the question? Yeah.
Yes, thank you. I do agree. Thanks a lot. Uh, do you restrict? Uh, do you have? Uh, do you recommend or restrict the patient after uh, recovery, after the last uh, day of treatment, to contraceptive uh, any contraceptive period, or just she can be pregnant uh, immediately, or you uh, prescribe for her six months or one year? And what is, is that a question following chemotherapy? Maybe both in low risk group, for example, in high risk groups, what is the period of contraceptives or contraceptive period? So whether patients have been through low risk chemotherapy or through high risk chemotherapy, our advice in the UK has traditionally been to wait one year after the end of their treatment, the last dose of the chemotherapy, until they try to get pregnant. Unsurprisingly to all the audience, many women don't want to wait so long and they get pregnant earlier. And when we last did an analysis, 500 of our patients at Charing Cross had got pregnant earlier than one year. They got pregnant sometimes within a few months and sometimes a bit longer, but certainly within the one year period. What happened to these women? The good news is there, were no, um, it, there was no increased risk of having damaged children. So it wasn't that the eggs were in some way damaged and there was an increased risk of having malformed babies. The babies that came out looked entirely normal. I cannot speak for what they are like as teenagers because we don't have that follow-up but if they're anything like my teenagers maybe you might think they weren't quite normal during the teenage period but certainly at birth they looked normal uh, there was no increased risk in miscarriages there was no increased uh, risk of having a molar pregnancy over and above what you would normally expect um, there was only one woman out of that 500 who had um, a late detected relapse and uh, she was detected uh, in her third trimester feeling short of breath and coughing up blood. Unsurprisingly, she had lung metastases and she went through chemotherapy. Her baby got delivered a bit early. Um, and of course everybody was anxious at the time, but in the end it was a happy story. The baby was fine, she was fine, and uh, nobody got to, uh, ended up with a death. So that was good. Um, so you could argue that the one in 500 risk of a serious problem arising means that maybe we could safely advise our patients to get pregnant earlier. Uh, and in the UK, we have been discussing this, uh, and recently I think our agreement is that we're going to say that um, beyond six months, they could, after finishing chemotherapy, they could start having a child. I routinely, when I see my patients for their last follow-up, six weeks after completing chemotherapy, share with them the data that we have, and then say it's up to them what they would like to do. And clearly, if they were 21, many of them are happy to wait a year. But if they're in their 30s, they obviously are much more keen to get on with having a child. Uh, so any more questions from the floor? Well, we would like uh, once again, Michael, to ask you about removal of the residual masses uh, if uh, the marker is normalized. Should we always do surgery uh, to remove residual masses if the marker is normal? The answer is no. Um, so for low risk disease, probably about 10% of women will have a residual lesion in their uterus or vascular change in their uterus and we don't do anything with those. Uh, and the last analysis shows again that there is no increased risk of relapse just because you have this persistent vascular change or lesion that's still visible. And our clinical impression where we have brought patients back for ultrasound, we don't routinely do this, but some patients are anxious and so we do bring them back. 
the lesions disappear over time, either before or after a subsequent pregnancy. Uh, for high-risk patients, um, then if there is a very large residual lesion left, for example, a single lesion left in the lung and you're worried, or there are multiple lesions left but one is particularly big and you're worried, then you can take that largest lesion out and look at it. So far in our experience, all we have found is dead tissue, rather like the case that we just heard now um, from our colleague in St. Petersburg, uh, just dead tissue. For the placental site trophoblastic tumors and epithelial trophoblastic tumors, where the disease is less sensitive to chemotherapy than the other forms of trophoblastic tumor, then I am much more keen to remove those residual masses because I cannot be sure that it's all dead tissue. And one more question. Today, uh, we have a very interesting, that's, I think that's our common opinion, we, today we had a very interesting and useful session and we uh, uh, really gained a lot uh, from that information, for instance, the use of carboplatin after the metatrexate uh, failure. So can you tell us, please, in your daily practice, which uh, regimen you use uh, more frequently if uh, metatrexate fails? Our, our practice at the moment is that if methotrexate fails and the HCG is um, 3,000 or less, then they receive actinomycin D, single agent treatment. And most of those women, I think, will be cured with that. If they fail the actinomycin D, then we move them on to Emaco treatment. If the HCG at the point of methotrexate resistance is above 3,000, but less than 30,000, then we are giving them carboplatin, AUC4, every two weeks. I can't tell you whether this is going to be a good treatment or not yet. We're still looking at that, and it will take us several years before we know whether it's a good treatment. If the HCG is over 30,000, then we are giving them Emaco treatment. Uh, the practice in Sheffield is slightly different in that they are using EA in place of Emaco, uh, but they use Emaco in high risk. So, slight variation. Thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, can I just thank you all very much for um, coming today. Um, I hope that you've enjoyed the session um, and we very much hope that uh, some, if not all of you, will come to our meetings on trophoblastic disease that are held in Europe and uh, um, more internationally. So there is the European Organization for the Treatment of Trophoblastic Disease. Uh, which um, is very easy for you to join. Um, and if you're uh, interested in joining it, uh, then please just email me and I will put you in touch with uh, the secretary of the organization and she will then put you on the mailing list for all of our meetings. The next meeting will be in Berlin on the 5th and 6th of July. But the meeting after that in a year's time will be in Porto in uh, Portugal. So there are annual meetings which you could potentially come to. Um, and there's also the International Society for the Study of Trophoblastic Diseases. And this has large meetings every two years, uh, the next of which is in Toronto this October. And again, if you're interested in that, please contact me or Leon Massaga, and we'd be very happy to put you in touch with the secretary who can have you on the mailing list. Um, thank you very, very much for coming today. I hope it's been a useful session for you.